<clears throat> Let's see. Check with this. Good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to the Washington Outsider. Uh, with you today is the editor in chief, that's me, Rina Zuckerman. And our special uh, speaker today is Kyle Glenn, uh, the co founder of the Comfort News and co host of the OSINT Bunker. He'll tell you about both of these platforms momentarily. Uh, today, we'll be discussing uh, his work in tracing. Uh, the Russian troop movements near the Ukraine borders through to videos, pictures, and so forth. Uh, uh, there's been an ongoing discussion how much of what we are seeing is preparation for a full-scale invasion and how much it is about uh, political pressure on the Biden administration and other parties to avoid um, a war. And we'll discuss uh, what can be gleaned from the current uh, images and how that sh this whole situation should be interpreted by policymakers and analysts watching the situation. Kyle, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, if you don't mind, uh, just tell us a little about yourself, your work, how you got into this particular area and... and oh. Oops, sorry. No, no problem. <laughs> sorry, I got disconnected for some reason. Uh, yeah, so uh, as I was saying, um, if you could just uh, introduce us to uh, to your work, your platforms, mm -hmm. and tell us a little bit about how you got into this area, and then we'll get more into the substance of the topic. Yeah, um, well, I first, I first started getting uh, involved in um, the kind of world of OSINT back in 2014, start of 2014. Um, quite, you know, luckily, well, not luckily, but uh, ironically, it was to do with Ukraine, the protests in Ukraine there in February of 2014. Um, I, I was watching a lot of, a lot of that was live streamed at the time on Facebook and um, I don't know if it was on Twitter at the time, but it was a lot of live stream. And it's when I start, first started getting uh an impression of how powerful social media was in you know in um in in protests at the time so there was i met a group of people on reddit um and we started updating um live updates as they were happening in a kind of just a, a kind of live update in fred that moved on to twitter we set up a specialized twitter account um, that focused solely on ukraine and then that went on to um, being a bit more specialized with conflict news where with the um, the ISIS invasion of Iraq in 2016 I might have got that wrong I want to say it's 2016 um, yeah 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 I think of it yeah 15 or 16 I believe it was um, so that's when we started conflict news we've had a few different people managing it over the years um, I, I think you know since 2014 there's been seven or eight different people um, at the moment there's there's three or four of us um that kind of you know when when we find time we 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 update the twitter account and the instagram account um with with the latest developments um and also i i co-host the uh ocean bunker podcast with three of us uh where we kind of round up the latest week or two weeks or you know the, the in between episodes of uh updates in in conflict zones around the world so we normally focus a lot on again ukraine at the moment as well as syria iraq uh, yemen um and wherever there's you know significant developments in in conflicts oh that's fascinating and what 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 actually drew you to conflict zones and to cover that to begin with? i mean many people watching we're watching ukraine on the news and whatever but not mm -hmm. everybody decided to give that uh coverage what what made you decide to do that no and 
it's, it's, it's a good question. And honestly, I don't think there's a, a straight answer. I think it's something I've always been interested in um, for a long time. I mean, I'll, I'll still go on Facebook and, you know, you can get like the, the Facebook memories of something you posted 12 years ago. And I find, I, you know, I, I might not have been as active in the, in the community, you know, 12, 13 years ago, but I, I, I found very old, cringy Facebook statuses maybe about, about um, Libya and Syria back when those were starting. So at least as far back as 2011, 2010, um, I was, I guess, aware of what was happening um, and, you know, the, the impact that social media was having at the same time. Mm -hmm. So what, what, what has that experience been like um especially uh given how much misunderstanding there is sometimes about foreign conflicts abroad mm -hmm. um yeah so it, it's been interesting because um you know prior to social media the only way you would ever find out what was happening in a war such as Ukraine or such as Syria or, or anything like that would be through official news sources. So, mm -hmm. um, and of course, I could that could that could be slow. I could take days or even weeks for for news to kind of trickle out. Um, and of course, every news agency has their own their own bias, their own spin they put on things. So, if we look at Ukraine, for example, a lot of the news coming out is either going to be from Ukrainian news sources or Russian news sources. Sure. Um, or of course, you know, when the war started, a lot of Western uh, news sources obviously went over there. But without social media, um, it would be a lot more difficult to get the information out. So obviously, through um, through social media and like using OSINT techniques, it's a lot easier and a lot uh, you can present the news in or try to present the news in a much more unbiased way by just presenting the facts rather than uh trying to put a spin or, or opinion or your slant on it so how do you pass through uh your new sources especially in the height of the conflict there's always a lot of disinformation unverified images and uh, outright fabrications yes no definitely and you know i i've definitely been fooled by them myself i'm not gonna say i haven't i think everyone has been fooled by them but you, you just have to kind of take those as a, a learning experience um and try not to let it happen again so the main thing i mean photographs uh i'd say the easiest to kind of try to verify um with, with you know with uh like you know there's reverse search engines so there's you know you, if you're on google chrome on a computer you can literally right click an image and click search google and it will show you if that image is has shown up anywhere else and when it was uploaded um, same as, um, I'm probably going to pronounce it wrong, it's the tin eye or tiny eye, I believe is another reverse search image. Um, and also the Russian um, Yandex, which is quite a powerful one as well. Um, so, you know, you can search all three of those uh, for images and at least that will give you an idea if the image you're looking at is, is new or old. Um, I've had experience of people who are trying to spread misinformation by uh, by, by like mirroring the image, flipping the image to like 180 degrees or, you know, like, yeah, like, like mirroring it um, to try and fool art, try and fool image searches. So if I search an image and it doesn't come up, I'll try and do the same thing. I'll, I'll mirror the image myself and search it again to see if that, um, to see if that shows up. Um, and, again, and again, you know, photos, um, if they're claiming one thing, um, and easily proven as another is it's you, you know if a video if a photo is proven to uh, claiming sorry to be um taken from ukraine and in the background there's a car with a french license plate for example you can you can you know you can easily say that it, you know it's it's more than likely false um and that's another thing which you know a lot of a lot of people not so much me i'm not great at geolocating things myself but there are a lot of very talented people who can look at an image of an empty field and some trees and, and narrow it down to a certain area of the country. You know, some people are, are very, very talented. Um, so if I do need something done like that, if I need to know exactly where a photo was taken or roughly, I, you know, there are other people I can reach out to, which is why I would say, you know, like OSINT is, is a collaborative effort. No one knows everything. 
so it's always good to have you know good friends you can you can reach out to who know a lot you know know more about you in in certain areas um there's one thing i noticed in problem various conflicts is that a lot of the time when there are no uh, western journalists on the ground or very few the coverage goes like well this party claimed uh, you know this is, you know happened and this other party said uh the opposite but there's no real um conclusion as to uh what actually happened a lot of the time how do you avoid that problem of having these narratives where it's not clear at all what if anything actually took place when there is a disputed claims on both sides um yeah no it is very difficult um and then an incident there's a couple of incidents from Ukraine, obviously, which which bring to mind um, back in the war in 2014, 2015. There was one um, in which there was, I believe it was a Ukrainian airstrike, uh, which killed a number of civilians. I don't have the number to hand at the moment, but it was a Ukrainian airstrike against a separatist position in, um, in a kind of a populated area, and it killed and wounded a, a number of civilians. Um, so obviously, you know, immediately the, the separatists, Russia, they said that it was an airstrike, it was a Ukrainian airstrike that's killed these people. Ukraine at the time claimed that um, that the separatists had fired an anti-aircraft missile at the jet, mm -hmm. which had locked onto a, I want to say an air conditioning unit or a heating unit or something like that on a building, and the missile had hit the building and killed the people. That was a Ukrainian claim at the time. Um, and I believe it was people working with Bellingcat who found a lot of photos and videos of clear evidence of an airstrike, um, a Ukrainian airstrike. I believe there was um, like a video of smoke trails in the sky and there was, a, there was the clear sound of a jet and there was, you know, I think there was a video of um, like, like, uh, like, like a lot of explosions in a row, like almost like a rocket strike of getting closer and closer and closer to the target. So it was clearly not what the Ukrainian side were claiming it to be. Um, and then on the other side of, you know, you know, of, um, of, of Ukraine, somewhat telling the truth, and, and Russia lying, obviously you have the shoot down of the Malaysian airliner, in which I believe Russia's official claim was it was a, a Ukrainian jet that shot it down. Um, and I believe, you know, the kind of global consensus was it was a separatist or a Russian uh, boot missile system which which shot it down back in 20, 2014 I think or 2015 I think that was 2014 um, and again there was there was plenty of videos and photos of of uh, anti-aircraft of the anti-aircraft missile system with uh, missing a missile um, being transported out of the country um, and you know you could almost track its path from where it fired the missile back into Russia. Uh, so th there are ways of uh, finding the truth, even if there are conflicting claims. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. I've uh, noticed that uh, a lot of the time, a lot of the people just don't really bother with the full on investigation. They just say, well, you know, that part, you know, that side said this and the other side said this and go let somebody else figure it out later. Um, that's why, you know, sometimes these mainstream kind of uh, coverage is not really all that comprehensive and I find it helpful to look at uh, this sort of close tracking of these incidents. Now, I have a bit of a controversial question for you um, before we get into this, the current specific circumstances. Mm -hmm. not, um, do you of, do sometimes find, find yourself in conflict with other uh, accounts or websites doing the same type of work um, over over the accuracy, over the coverage, or over agendas, or over anything of that sort. Um, yeah, no, definitely. I'd you know I, I'd like to say that everyone in you know the OSIC community gets along, but that's not the case. You know, all the time, a lot of people will disagree with each other, and there are certain accounts who. Um, you know, I might not get along with like that. Uh, will put their own slant or embellish certain things, um, and I've definitely, you know, and and others have have had you know quite public disagreements with them on on social media about certain things. Um, 
a lot of the time it is constructive. You know, I'm in a lot of group chats and and Discord channels with a lot of other people who are interested in you know in, in OSINT. And for the most part, if there is a disagreement, it's it is constructive and um, things get worked out. You know, like I might say that tank is a certain model of tank. Someone else might say it's a different one. Um, and you know, it might, it'll go back and forth. Or some people, you know, when trying to find a location of something. Mm-hmm. you know it, it's very difficult um but uh, yeah but I, yeah so yeah you will have disagreements not everyone's going to agree with what you say 100 percent of the time um but as long as you know as long as the disagreement is constructive then i've got no problem with it like i said i, I um everything's always a learning every day is a learning day even i think half an hour ago i posted something on twitter um and I got it slightly wrong and someone corrected me, which is fine. You know, it's, <laughs> I'm happy to learn, you know, I'm always happy to be wrong if, if, you know, if, if it's if there's something to learn from it. Um, and, and, you know, and, and that's the good thing about it. You know, it's, it's so open that if you do make a mistake, there's, there, there is the opportunity there for other people to correct you. Um, and then, you know, and for you to correct others as well. And that just, it's a positive thing in the long run. For there to be that kind of um can't think of the word like oversight i guess you know everyone's kind of holding each other to account you know you can't claim something ridiculous because you know you'll get called out for it um so yeah no it's 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 interesting for sure and what would you advise an average social media user seeking to you know who just decided to get to in to be interested in a particular topic or issue or conflict but and starts following random OSINT accounts. How how is somebody who is not familiar with OSINT techniques or is new to the scene supposed to make a determination what is accurate and what is not? How, what mm-hmm. would you advise them to look for in in doing that sort of uh, uh, independent um, work? Yeah, so I think the obvious thing you should look for if you if you're not sure what kind of accounts to start following um, is. Um, it, well, it depends what you're looking for. If you're looking for an objective view of things, then that's what you should look. You should look for accounts that post, you know, the facts and and try not to have an opinion on it. Mm-hmm. Um, that's that's the main thing. Um, you know, there are there are plenty of accounts out there which you know, if you want to follow accounts which will only focus on like one side of the conflict, that's absolutely fine. You know, I I deal with a lot of them, and I have no issues with them a lot of them you know will be again if we look at ukraine there are plenty of ukrainian accounts who do a lot of good work and obviously they're going to be biased you know you're not you're not going to get an unbiased ukrainian account talking about ukrainian war when their country's been invaded you know it's it's very very rare for that to happen so i i think you know a little bit of bias isn't the worst thing as long as you can look at it objectively and know that okay this account is biased they're claiming this one thing maybe i'll look at two or three other accounts to see what they're saying um because that's what you'll find you'll find if there's a big event um again especially if there's an ongoing war like ukraine and it's a big event they they won't just be one account talking about it if there is that's a red flag it's probably not true if it's just one person claiming something um you know if, if there's a lot of different accounts you'll get You'll get the same story six or seven times in a very slightly different way, I'm sure, um, depending on who's saying, who's claiming it. Um, so, you know, I, I, what the advice I would give is to, yeah, to try maybe follow an entire spread of accounts. Um, because myself, I myself follow, I'll follow a bunch of, you know, Russian propaganda accounts to see what they're saying, you know, because it's good mm-hmm. to get, to get you know, their side of things. Because if you just follow one side, you're never going to get a full picture. So, you know, if you look at what the Ukrainians are saying, what the Russians are saying, the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. You know, you don't know which end, but it's it's probably in the middle somewhere. Um, but if you're looking, uh, you know, for a good start of accounts to follow, um, you know, Bell and Cat, um, who do, you know, fantastic work, they've got um, on their website, they've got a bunch of, um, like, new new starter guides, I guess, for OSINT. So a bunch of guides for people for people who are just getting into into the you know the um the community, um and they you know they they list um like Discord channels to join, like people on Twitter to follow, um, you know, like techniques, websites to use for them to kind of you know get their skills up themselves. So like the Bellingcat website itself is 
a great resource for anyone who's new and trying to understand what's going on. Um, and, and once you follow two or three people, you know, you can check who they're interacting with. Um, and then you can follow them and follow and follow who they follow and follow who they follow. And, you know, soon enough, you'll, you'll build up a decent list of, um, you know, people who you, who you feel like you can get trustworthy news from yourself. And what, what happens if, for instance, some relatively reliable names, accounts, and so forth, end up picking up, you know, what appears to be, you know, a, a very sensational story uh, mm -hmm. or narrative, and it becomes bigger and bigger and more and more mainstream media picks it up, and then you, you start searching into it, and you have trouble finding any concrete evidence to support it. But it keeps kicking, you know, big and big audience. And I've seen that in several conflicts at this point. But how, how, what do you do, and how do you start discrediting something or questioning something that, you know, everybody who is in the know is pushing? And you know, when there's a lot of basically emotional investment into something that's that's very obviously controversial. Yeah. So if there's something which 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 I've looked into and I, I believe to be false, um, which which has happened in the past. I've seen a lot of um, accounts which I interact with regularly post something, perhaps not thinking or perhaps not doing, you know, maybe in a rush of have not done, you know, the proper background checks, which again, I'm not going to say I haven't done it. I have, you know, I've seen something, I've posted it. It might not have been 100% accurate. Um, but again, that's, that's how you learn. Um, but the, the, what I would do, I would normally, I would... If, if I can't respond to them all individually, I normally put my own tweet or my own post out mm -hmm. explaining why this thing is false. Um, and then again, like I said, I'm in a lot of group chats uh, on Twitter and on other social media, in which case I could post my own tweet there and then I could explain to the people in that group chat, um, you, you know, what, what happened. Um, and then from there, of course, they'll, they'll retweet it and they'll retweet it, they'll retweet it and try to get as much impressions on what appears to be the truth as 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 we can. Um, it, it's not always possible to stop, um, you know, kind of false information spreading. Uh, you know, a recent example was they were um, they were Saudi airstrikes in Yemen in the last couple of days, um, and obviously, as soon as the airstrikes start, people start posting photos on Twitter because you know, people in Yemen, you know, if, if an airstrike happens outside your door, you're going to take a photo of it as you do. Sure. So, so people, they take photos, they take videos, they post them on, on, on Twitter. Um, and a lot of accounts picked up uh, a couple of videos, which were from 2014, I think 2013 or 2014, and just start posting these videos saying, oh, they, they're from tonight. Um, so it, it wasn't a big deal. You know, it wasn't mm -hmm. massively false news. It wasn't damaging in any way. Um, but it just shows how easily it can happen because videos are very very difficult to verify especially videos of an explosion at night you know it's just darkness and then flames and you know it's unless you've seen that video personally it's very difficult to say it's new or it's old or or anything like that um and again you know going back to ukraine there was a video a couple of weeks back of um uh, there was a video of it was just uh, someone filming like their city skyline with their phone, and in the background there were um, explosions, like you know artillery. You could hear art artillery going off, um, and it turned out that someone, uh, obviously trying to spread misinformation, had taken that video and taken the audio from another video and put them together to make a new video, and it was only. Um, that someone recognized that the audio sounded like a video they'd seen before mm -hmm. and found that video. Um, and then um, another Twitter account kind of got both videos and matched the audio and found that the audio was 100% identical. That was the way that they proved that that video was false. But, you know, the, it's, it's, very, like, it's very difficult to prove that. I mean, look, who's going to go out of their way to, to check the audio on videos? You know, let's, let's not... I mean, someone that's obsessed like like, like <laughs> ourselves. Um, yeah, but you know, to the average person, or even to my, you know, it's even to myself. I was like, okay, that looks like a new video. I don't recognize the video. I don't, you know, I don't know if I ever recognize audio, but as you know, I, it sounded new. 
Um, but obviously that's the danger. And, and again, we, at that point, we do rely on, on people just having a good memory. So, just, you know, really <laughs> to remember that they've seen or heard something before. Um, and that's when it gets really difficult. Like photos are a lot easier to verify than, yeah. than videos, especially videos at night, which are a nightmare. I try to stay away from it altogether unless I'm, unless I'm 100% sure. Um, yeah, but no, it's, it's, it's very tricky. Do you, uh, do you keep a database of videos you encounter as you go along to maybe help you to avoid you know, repetitive videos? Uh, you know that come back to haunt you after a few years when somebody recycles them mm -hmm. um not that's a good idea it's maybe something i should start doing <laughs> um i don't yeah. have like a database to speak, you know but... I, i'll be honest with you personally from you know just the yemen story i found it extremely unhelpful that nobody seems to have a database of the findings and you know whether photos or videos so it's very hard to keep track of new information in general forget verifying what happened and what didn't just to keep track or if you want to find something it's scattered all over the internet and the arabic names and so forth and unless you just download it the moment you see it and save it it's almost impossible to find it when you're looking for a piece of evidence and to, to, for something so no, yeah that's I, what I was definitely. yeah um the issue is there was for Syria, there was a really, or there's been a couple of very, very useful YouTube accounts, which were archived, again, like videos that were coming out of Syria, they would download them, they would archive them, they would upload them to their YouTube account. Um, and again, that was, you know, very, very useful for, for people like us who, who look into these things and try to find old videos. Um, but YouTube just keeps deleting them, they keep removing the accounts for terms of service violations, mm -hmm. because, you know, violence or, or, or everything like that. And it's a nightmare because without this without this database of videos there's there's nothing we can you know there's, there's no way we can find if something's old or new just on memory alone especially um in ukraine a war now that's been going on well eight years i mean the the, the good i say good thing the kind of lucky thing for people trying to find these videos is there's only really been heavy fighting in 2014 and 2015 um and then 20 well tail end of 2015 onwards it's just been the front lines haven't changed it's just been shelling and gunfire um so it's you know it, it, there's not a lot of videos um that come out unless it's something significant um you know people people i mean i speak to people living in eastern ukraine quite regularly um and i'll see a report that there's been shelling you know, in their neighborhood, and I'll message them, you know, check they're okay. And, and they'll be like, oh, was there? I didn't, I didn't even notice. And they'll open their window and they'll be like, oh yeah, there is, I can hear it now. But they're so desensitized to it almost that they don't even notice when the shelling starts because they've got all their windows, I mean, it's freezing, isn't it, <laughs> in Eastern Ukraine. <laughs> so they've got the, the yeah. windows closed, they're probably double or triple glazed or, or whatever. Um, and yeah, they, they, they said they barely notice that the explosions are there or the, the, the shelling has started a lot of the time. So unless it's something significant, they don't always pay attention to what's going on. They might not, they'd be like, well, what if I filmed every explosion, I'd be there all day kind of thing. Um, so, and that's, you know, when the fighting has now kind of picked up um, over the last, well, it was December now, over the last eight months, March, April, so nine, eight or nine months, um, there has been a lot more videos um, coming out um, from the front line because the fighting has escalated um, and a lot of them um, again are, are difficult to verify because they are just someone in their garden or hanging out their window kind of film in the distance and you just hear the explosions you don't see anything mm -hmm. so it's very difficult to kind of see um, or, or tell where the fighting is you, you can you know a lot of the time they'll say in the video location this you know the location of the town or the suburb or whatever um so you can have a rough idea um but you you don't know how to say for sure um there, there, there are the, the, you know the, the couple of videos there was one recently um that had it was clearly um you you the ukrainian forces were on top of a hill 
clearly, you know, it was kind of, and they were firing down the hill at separatist positions with what looked like um, like an armored vehicle, like a BMP or some kind. And you could see the shots coming down the hill, you know, like, you know, one after the other, they were firing shots down the hill. So with that video, it was quite useful because, you know, you knew which town it was in. And, you know, even someone like myself, it's not very good at locating, <laughs> locating where videos are shot. Um, you, you know, you could, you could tell where the Ukrainian positions were, you could tell where the separatist positions were. And from, you know, from videos like that, you can draw a picture of what the front line looks like um, and, and, you know, take it from there. So you just brought up an excellent point that I think many people are coming in and not fully aware of, which is that the conflict in Ukraine has never fully uh, been, never fully ended. No. Uh, people remember the Crimea annexation, they remember the Russian involvement, they remember the uprising. They kind of forget that for all these years, it's been a low grade conflict that Paxton reigned, but never fully um, ended. And what you just mentioned that it has escalated over the eight, last eight months, people, I don't think that has received any coverage whatsoever up until the point that Russia started moving its troops mm -hmm. to the borders. No, exactly. I, I, um, I think I remember reading back in when Russia first moved the troops back in, running March and April, that the Ukrainian government was saying, so, so back in July 2020, um, the government and the separatists signed a new ceasefire. Obviously, they signed a ceasefire in 2015, like the Minsk agreements, which mm -hmm. are a ceasefire in name only. It's not a ceasefire. Mm -hmm. um, but they kind of, they signed a new agreement in July 2020. Um, and I think he said they said between July 2020 and April 2021, um, there was 50 or 60 Ukrainian soldiers killed, which is you know not a huge huge number, but it's a significant number of soldiers that are killed over a you know a, a um, like a 10 month period. Um, so it, you know it's definitely. Yeah, the, the war never ended. You know, it, it, there's constantly shelling back and forth. There's constantly snipers firing at each other. There's constantly, um, which is the new thing at the moment, kind of uh, commercial drones, like quadcopters, dropping grenades on each other. Um, there was even a video released in the last couple of hours by a Ukrainian channel of a drone um, killing what they claim was a, a Russian lieutenant um, in eastern Ukraine. Um, and, and drones like that, they've always been um, used. And again, to kind of bring it back to ISIS, ISIS used them to great, you know, uh, you know, a great number of drones was used by ISIS. They kind of popularized the kind of commercial drone use as a military um, military use. Um, but yeah, in, in Ukraine, it seems that both the Ukrainian soldiers and Russian separatists are just flying these you know, these drones over the front line and dropping grenades into trenches. And, you know, it's it's really, really effective, you know, from the videos that are coming out, you know, more, much more effective than just firing blindly or shelling blindly without knowing if you're, you're hitting anything. Um, and so obviously that's um, part of the escalation. And of course the other escalation was, um, I've looked, completely lost track of time. It might be November. It might be the summer for all I know. But when Ukraine used their um, Turkish TB2 drone to destroy a separatist artillery piece that was firing on them, that was a big, big escalation from Ukraine. Um, it's part of the um, Minsk agreements 2015 uh, was that, well, well, it, well, it was just that they'd be shooting no airstrikes. It, and obviously... A drone, even though there's no one flying it, is absolutely an aerial vehicle, and any kind of attack is an airstrike. So that was a um, a big escalation. I, I don't know if anyone was killed from it, but they definitely destroyed a, a, um, a howitzer, like an artillery piece. Um, so yeah, the, the fighting has kind of slowly been creeping up and creeping up. Um, I believe you know, in, even in the last 24 hours, there's been another two Ukrainian soldiers quite seriously wounded. Um, according to the Ukrainian MOD. Um, so, you know, the, the casualties keep going up and going up. And I suppose with that, it, it is the danger that there's like a miscalculation which results in 
or not even a miscalculation, a, an attack which results in a, ha a high number of casualties, in which point it's, if things will start snowballing again in a way that no one can kind of stop and lead to a, you know, a resumption of the kind of full-scale hostilities in eastern Ukraine. Well, it sounds like the use of the Turkish drones was more of a qualitative uh, difference in the in the effectiveness of the drones than necessarily a new a new violation of the Minsk uh, agreement based on the previous use of other types of drones by both parties. So it didn't really. It was only an escalation in so far as these drones are, you know, more effective in uh, newer models as opposed to the previous uh, use of grenades. No, d yeah, no, definitely. You, you definitely could say that. Um, I suppose the, the thing that Russia was really unhappy about was the kind of use of the, the, the Turkish drone. It kind of changed the balance of power away from the separatists. So at the moment, you know, w without that Turkish drone in, in Eastern Ukraine, you know, they both have, I mean, I'm not sure what kind of number of troops they have, but let's say for argument's sake, they have a similar number of troops, um, a similar number of tanks, a similar number of artillery pieces, and like a similar number of, you know, armored personnel carriers. You know, it, it, they'll say they're quite evenly matched on paper. Um, the one thing that Ukraine always had that, obviously was that the separatists didn't was they had an air force which mm -hmm. they used in in 2014 and 2015 um not as much um well not as much sorry not they didn't use it a lot it was definitely um quite heavy it was quite heavily used around i think around donetsk airport during the battle there um um, but then when um, there was the, I, think, I believe one of the helicopters was shot down. Um, and then I think the day before, or maybe two days before um, the Malaysian airliner was shot down, there was also a Ukrainian transport plane that was shot down um, and killed 40 or 50 people, I believe 40, 50 soldiers. Um, and I think I think from that plane being shot down, I believe Ukraine kind of grounded their air force and they said it was not worth them risking any more aircraft in, in the war in, in eastern Ukraine. And then obviously a couple of days later, there was the shoot down of Malaysian airliners. Um, so, yeah, I think the, the kind of use of the drone is in Russia's eyes, kind of Ukraine starting to use their air force again in a, in a, in a small way. Um, and of course, you know, the, the Russian separatists, while they've got the, the commercial drones, which mm -hmm. can drop the grenades, it's, it, it doesn't really compare to, you know, military grade, you know, Turkish or these Turkish drones, which as um, if anyone watched, you know, again, like the war between Armenia and Azerbaijan um, recently, yeah. you know, the, uh, the Azerbaijani drones just they, they were the absolute turning point or not a turning point but absolutely what won that war for Azerbaijan was the use of their drones um, and again in Libya um, Turkish drones absolutely turned, turned the war there um, and in Syria when Assad and Russia were launching the offensive in Idlib um, and Turkey launched their, their counter-offensive the Again, the drones were absolutely what what destroyed and, and had you know had the most impact. Um, so I think to, uh, Russia are very much aware of that. You know, they've come up against these Turkish drones a few times. They're very much aware of how effective they are, um, and I, I don't think they want them to be used in any real way in eastern Ukraine. And I think that's part of the reason why they're also starting to push back in the way that they are. So you, you made an interesting note that, I, again, I don't think has been distinctly made enough in the coverage, which is the difference in Ukraine's military superiority with respect to the separatists and with respect to Russia's own forces. Now, Russia made it very clear that they support the separatists. It's mm -hmm. no longer a secret. It's public information. And some of the separatists, in fact, claim that Russia is planning to give them a Russian citizenship, but I'm not sure about that personally. I don't think that's part of Russia's plans at all. Now, 
uh, the interesting thing here is that clearly Russia so far has in general by every criteria significant military superiority over Ukraine. The question is in the confrontation with Russia, will those Turkish drones make enough of a difference versus just dealing with the with the with the with the ongoing conflict with the separatists where clearly it's actually turning the war around for Ukraine. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, if this is, uh, because we have seen, again, Armenia is not Russia. It has, you know, it has a completely different, it's, a, you know, they've received assistance from Russia, they've received some technology, but it's not the same size uh, army. Uh, the Wagner, the Wagner group, in Libya is again not a full sized it's a specialized force but it's not you know the full sized military but what we are looking at with Russia now it's their formal military being moved to the borders yeah which raises the question whether their air force would also be used so the question of course would be whether those drones would be effective against conventional air forces um no i, I don't think the, the the drones themselves will be enough against um against russia um the, you know the, the russian air force is, is is very strong and they've got i mean met them many times the size of the ukrainian air force to even start with um and the, these drones these turkish drones they, they're not designed up oh, sorry one second my Sorry, my Google <laughs> was going off. Um, yeah, so yeah, the Russian Air Force is many times the size of the Ukrainian Air Force. They've got the 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 aircraft they use are much more sophisticated um, and will have absolutely no issue at all shooting down these these Turkish drones. Um, we've seen that in in Georgia in 2008. Um, I don't believe I remember which drone Georgia was using, but they were using a a drone to monitor the conflict and there's a um a video quite a really interesting video that shows a russian jet kind of you see it on the on the, the footage of from the drone the russian jet kind of passes in a distance it turns it fires a missile you see the missile come towards the drone and then the drone's gone you know the, the, the feed kind of cuts off um so the russian air force alone would you know, be able to knock these Turkish drones out of the sky without breaking a sweat, really. Um, I suppose it depends on, at that point, how good Ukraine's air defense is, mm -hmm. um, which, as we it, it's it's not the most sophisticated. I believe the best air defense they have is the S-300 system, um, mm -hmm. the Russian S-300 system. Um, I think they've got maybe three or four batteries of that. Um, I haven't seen it deployed anywhere, uh, especially not in the Donbass region. It's, it's as far as I can tell, I, it's um, at least recently um, not been spotted by um, the OSCE observers who are there observing the, the ceasefire. Um, obviously, they, they uh, release daily reports of how the ceasefire is going in the Donbass region. And one of the things they do and one of the things I pay um, special attention to is they make note of the vehicles and the weapons that are spotted near the front line uh, and whether they're beyond or within the um the withdrawal lines that were agreed in 2015. um so you know quite regularly they will spot um you know ukrainian tanks and ukrainian artillery at train stations near the front line, which would argue or will suggest they're either being moved in or moved out, more than likely moved in the way things are going. Um, and sometimes they'll spot um, like artillery systems, um, like rocket artillery is, is a big one. Um, it was, you know, used widely in 2014, 2015. There's, you know, a, a lot of videos of, of um, like Russia's separatists, um, you know, you know, ordering a launcher of you know four or five truckloads worth of, of rockets, which is I'm sure absolutely terrifying to be on on the other end of. Um, but you know, luckily again, going you know the rocket artillery hasn't been widely used since 2015. 
um, it's been mostly mortars and kind of just towed or, or self-propelled howitzers, which have been used in the fighting. Um, so yeah, the, the, the OSC reports are, are really useful for getting an idea of um, if there's if there's a a buildup, or also um, they've spotted weapons in separatist hands, which were never sold to Ukraine, so they could only have come from Russia. So there was um, you know there was a an upgraded version of the the BM twenty one Grad artillery system, rocket artillery which I, I believe it wasn't a, a major upgrade. They just changed the kind of truck. It was just, um, kind of like on, um, but that that version of the system was never sold to Ukraine. It was only ever used in Russia. And then they are in the hands of separatists who claim that they only ever get their weapons from Ukrainian weapon stores or, or know, stuff like that. They, they claim all their weapons were captured. So, you know, the reports do a good job in that way of kind of disproving the disinformation or a lie I suppose is the better way of putting it that Russia claim that they don't support the separatists that they don't provide weapons um because you know how does a weapon that only came into service in 2016 end up in 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 eastern Ukraine when it was when it hasn't been sold um yeah so that's that, that's definitely one I like to keep an eye on as well so you make yet another good point that I think is not highlighted enough, which is this difference in military superiority. Is it directly rejoined that to Russia's claims that Ukraine's um, purchase of weapons and uh, from Western countries is a threat to Russia's uh, borders and security? Because first of all, there is no evidence that Ukraine is moving anywhere towards Russia's borders. And second, there is no evidence that Russia would, you know, would is in any danger considering the the vast difference in 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 the military equipment, let alone forces? No, I mean y- Ukraine is is absolutely no threat to Russia. You know, in in no in no kind of <laughs> in certain terms. You know, I I, I I'm sure. Um, you know, Russia Russia likes to claim they you know being bullied and they and a threat by you know the big bad Ukraine, but it's it's absolute nonsense. Um, you know the the weapons that the uh, the West, the US especially, have provided to Ukraine, like the, you know the javelin missiles. Um, they're not going to, you know, they're not going to suddenly allow Ukraine to be able to march into Moscow because they've got some new missiles. That's not the way it works. Um, the only thing it will do is, I mean, honestly, it will make things more difficult for Russia. I mean, if Russia decides to invade with, I can't remember what the number is at the moment, 120, 130,000 troops on the border. 175 by this point. Oh, well, even more. Um, Then, you know, it'd be very difficult for Ukraine to do more than put up a, you know, brave resistance, should we say. You know, it's, there's not many countries on the planet that could, withstand a direct invasion from Russia, especially with that amount of troops. Um, so, you know, the, 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 you know, a, a few crates of bullets here and a couple of javelin missiles there are absolutely no threat to Russia. Um, of course, Russia likes to claim, I mean, they're demanding that if Ukraine was part of NATO, then things might be different, which, you know, I, I can see Russia's perspective on that one, you know, if NATO's expansion, um, you know, we, we, if you know, if Ukraine joined NATO, that would be another NATO member on Russia's borders, which they obviously see as as unacceptable. Which, again, I, I don't, I don't blame <laughs> blame them for thinking that, but you know, threatening to invade your neighbours isn't the way to protest it, shall we say? Um, I believe today again, you know, they, they've demanded that NATO. Um, you know, take back the promise made in 2008 that Georgia and Ukraine could join NATO. They didn't give a time frame. NATO didn't. They, NATO said, you know, some at some point, someday, you can join NATO to Ukraine and uh, Georgia. And Russia has said, you have to say no. You know, Russia demanding that NATO takes back that promise, 
which isn't going to happen, which you know is never going to no. happen. But there is a question: Why is Russia making this demand now when there is no timeline and no no real threat whatsoever? No, exactly. It, it is. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a question for someone I'm sure more more intelligent and paid a lot more than me to, to answer. Um, the why Russia now are, are making these threats? Um, because you know, for people who might not have been watching um, the war even back as at the start of this year when we had almost the the dress rehearsal, the dry run of what's happening now in March and April, when Russia kind of built up on the border, they made a lot of threats. Um, and then they, by um, by May, June, they, they left, they went home again and, and nothing happened. Um, and then, you know, back in, and then things started building up again in October and especially November and now into December, things are, escalating and escalating and escalating um and russia are making a lot more um worrying demands um to to nato and to the us uh and 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 again i don't it seems like it's 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 not so much about ukraine anymore and more about russia and nato it, it seems ukraine are just unfortunately caught in the middle of it um and are being used um I've got no doubt being used by both sides, both, both you know, both the US and Russia, both will be influencing or in, or trying to influence Ukraine to to um, move in the direction. Um, and obviously, that's what started the that's what started the whole war back in 2014 was the protests against. Um, I'm going to forget his name now. The president was it Yanuk Yanukovych in 2014. Yanukovych, yes. Um, when he was ousted by um but after the protests he fled to russia um and ukraine at that point i believe in russia's eyes was turning far too much to the west and to the eu specifically um and that's what led to the invasion of crimea um primarily i, I again I, I'm, that was definitely russia's primary goal was was crimea i think what happened in the donbass region was more punishment i think for ukraine for what they were doing for what they were looking towards the west and looking towards europe i think they've you know destabilized the country there um because it hasn't gained russia or anything obviously crimea is is a massive gain for russia you know they end up with a couple of new ports in the black sea they end up with you know crimea i mean, I mean crimea was russian at one point i believe it was gifted to ukraine um I'm not going to guess the year because I'm going to look stupid and get miles off. No, original Crimea was actually Turkish, which Russia oh. conquered back in the day in the 19th century during the Russo-Turkish War. Then it was part of the Soviet Union. And then ultimately, during the breakdown of the Soviet Union, it was, uh, you know, Ukraine was given control, but it wasn't at no point Russia's, you know, as in current modern state yeah the like russian federation it was yes. never part of, of russia as they are today no yeah but, but okay yeah, that is interesting um but they, they always claimed that it was um ethnically russian as they claim you know the the donbass region and and that's again what they a part a big part of it at the moment is they say in ukraine are um what's the word i'm thinking of can't think of the word uh, oppressing Ukraine or oppressing Russian uh, Russians in Eastern Ukraine is is the the, the line from from Moscow. Um, I believe Putin even recently said it looked like um, genocide, which was a completely ridiculous statement to make. Um, but again, you know, it's a concerning one because you know I don't think you can say that someone is genociding or looking like genocide you know, Russian national or Russian, Russian ethnic Russians um, and then do nothing about it. You know, it, it just it, it would make Russia look weak almost. You know, if if you said, oh, you know, that country of there are, are genociding our people, we're not going to do anything about it. I don't think that looks very good internally. So I think for them to use the the language that, you know, Ukraine are, are try, again they're saying that Ukraine are going to try and conquer the Donbass region through force and it's it's looking like genocide and it's looking like this and it's looking like that and Russians are being oppressed it's all kind of setting the groundwork for Russia to 
justify what might happen if they if they kind of invade and and annex that region, which is is a real possibility. Um, but what's interesting is um, that the Russian troops aren't just on the border of the Donbass. So they, they, you know, they're not the Donbass is on Russia's western border, Ukraine's eastern border, um, well, southeastern, I guess. Um, but there's a lot of Russian troops um, in the north, kind of, you know, a few hundred kilometers away from the front line, um, and only you know 20 to 50 kilometers away from the Ukrainian border. Which are building up there, which is um, the, I think the most concerning thing, uh, because you know an invasion into Ukraine properly would would have you know n you could argue well nothing at all to do with what's going on in the Donbass region, um, and would be an entirely different conflict altogether. Uh, some of the Russian bases, you know, they they they're, they're closer to Belarus um, and just north of Kiev. Um, which are nowhere near the front line. So why Russia are, are staging troops there is, you know, I, again, it's the whole point of the talk, I suppose. Is, is it is it a real threat or is it just um, exactly. is it just a bluff? Um, but yeah, there's there's a lot of troops kind of being moved towards Belarus, um, and um, you know, a, a friend of mine, the Twitter account. Uh, Kushua, I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrong. Um, he, he recently found on satellite imagery, he found a, um, a, a Russian base, or it looks like a Russian base, again, quite close to the Belarusian border, which has been, which I, I checked myself, has been almost empty for the last three years, 2019, 2021, 20, almost empty. Um, and then in the last two weeks, a lot, a lot of equipment as we moved into this boot, into this base, you know, close to the Belarusian border and close to the Ukrainian border. Um, and, it, you know, it's been done quite quietly as well. There's been a lot of videos um, released about it um, on social media. You know, um, people in the Bryansk region will post videos on, on TikTok of these convoys going past. Um, but there's been no real word from Russia about why they lay. You know, back in March and April, in the last build-up, um, they were insisting that everything was an exercise, there were exercises here, there were exercises there, this is, you know, nothing to worry about, we're just exercising, these are just preparations, whatever. The fact that now they, they're doing the same level of build-up, if not more, like quite a high level of build-up, and not denying it, they're not trying to hide it, or well, they are hiding it, they're not trying to justify it in any way is far more concerning, I think, to me at least. That actually points to the high likelihood that not only that whatever the case may be with the initial buildup of troops and the saber rattling over the over the Donbass uh, issue, uh, Russia does have full intentions of entering uh, Ukraine for whatever other reasons that may not even be directly related to that and it, it sounds to me like this is not about psychological pressure on any particular purchases they're not making any demands and actually this is more similar to the Crimea scenario where where the entry of the little green man was kind of clandestine and not open and denied than about this whole then you know the open open threat it's almost like the uh, the movement towards the Donbass border was a uh, the Donbass area was uh, was a distraction from those movements over there because that's all everyone is talking about and not really talking about what you just uh, what you just mentioned so much in the mas mainstream discourse certainly not on the political level it's really not being all mentioned there was a discussion about the east about the territories that uh, Biden wanted uh, Zelensky to consider. Um, making autonomous or seeking or whatever, but there was really no discussion about what that would do to the proliferation of troops and weapons and bases in other areas, really. Yeah, no, definitely. And I, I said, I think, you know, maybe the, 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 the focus on Donbass is exactly what Russia wanted, because mm -hmm. um, I, I, again, when things are starting to build up, that's exactly the region that I was looking in for, for a kind of build up. I was looking in, in the kind of um, the, you know, like Russia's, you know, the kind of Ukrainian Russian border in that region 
for a build-up and th there wasn't one as such but then you look at Crimea and you look to like the northern border you know near Belarus and that's where there are a lot a lot of troops um I haven't seen as such and I'm probably wrong um but I don't think there are as many you know kind of uh Russian bases or, or kind of build up in the you know on the Russian side of the Donbass border um they all seem to be kind of elsewhere where you might not expect them to be um and again that is I think the far more concerning thing um and of course you know if there is an offensive obviously the Donbass region will be um massively involved because not only uh, have you got um you know like hundreds well like over like 100 over 150,000 Russian troops spread around Ukraine you've still got um I, I think just trying to get think of the number I've seen recently I, think, I believe like 20 to 30,000 separatists or separatists should we say in in the Donbass region um who are for all intents and purposes part of the Russian military um within Ukraine at the moment. So if Russia did decide to push from the northern border or if they decided to push from Crimea, they could absolutely also push from the Donbass region or they could push from all three areas at the same time, which again, well, like I said earlier, there's not many countries on the planet that could withstand a, a kind of a three-pronged attack from the Russian military. Well, so, we, are, we are looking at this encirclement strategy, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, with potentially as many as three fronts, which Russia is perfectly to, equipped to handle simultaneously, and Ukraine is most likely not. No, exactly. And I, I suppose the one thing that Ukraine might have on their side is, um, again, they've been at war for eight years, you know, in, in the Donbass region. They're going to have a lot of combat experienced soldiers um, over the last eight years. Obviously, the separatists, the DNR, the LNR, they will have as well. Um, so, you know, I, I think there will be a lot of very, very difficult fighting if anything happens in the in the Donbass region. Um, but the Russian military, like infantry, they they haven't had a lot of combat experience over the last few years. Obviously, in Syria, they've had um, handfuls of fighting in um, in the eastern desert against ISIS. There's been a little bit there. Um, but it's been largely um, airstrikes. It's been the Russian Air Force that have been involved in Syria, um, which, again, if, if there is a conflict in Ukraine, the Russian Air Force, I believe, will be heavily, heavily involved. Um, and, you know, the, you can almost expect, you know, a, a day or a couple of days or even more of, of airstrikes before Russia even crosses the border, if, if that was to happen. Um, but yeah, I think yeah, if 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 Ukraine does have an advantage in in any way, it's um, well, it's one that you know the the area they they know the area they're defending. They've got the home advantage, shall we say, um, and two that they've got a lot of combat trained, a lot of combat experienced troops over the last over the last eight years. Um, I mean, I, I can't imagine Russia will just use conscripts in any offensive i mean obviously they'll, they'll, they'll probably use you know, professional contract soldiers um but again they'll be rather inexperienced in an actual war um how much of a difference that will make when you know a lot of this war it may, it might be decided by airstrikes or the air force you know it's hard to say um but yeah that's that, that i think that's the one thing that ukraine might be have the upper hand in it's just the experience of the troops at the moment so the question is all right so russia has you know a, a significant air advantage mm -hmm. nevertheless it's also moving a huge number of largely inexperienced troops to the border what does that tell us about you know and, and as you said most likely they're not going to start with those they're going to start with the airstrikes so why what what is the message being some here and to what end when it's very obvious to everyone that the real battle will start with missiles and and so forth no yeah that's is a good question and 
again, one, it's it's very difficult to say exactly what the message is. We, um, I mean, obviously, it's it's good to have these troops close by, mm-hmm. um, so you can then move them very quickly towards towards the front. I mean, a lot of these bases are um, a couple of hours drive from the border um, at most. You know, they they fifty to one hundred and fifty kilometers from the border, should we say? So if Russia does decide they want to move their troops up into Ukraine, they could do so very, very quickly. Um, so, and I, and I suppose, with the, you know, where they're kind of stationed at the moment, there's no real risk of them being targeted by Ukraine. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they, 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 I mean, they could, you know, you could, Ukraine could try to strike these these staging grounds, you know, a couple of hundred kilometers into into Russia, but I, I don't think they'd get very far that way. You know, Russian air defense is very strong. Um, and um, as we've seen, uh, again, in the in the recent war between Armenia and Azerbaijan, um, Armenia fired um, a couple of ballistic missiles um, into Azerbaijan mm-hmm. um, and ended up deliberately or accidentally i i can't say for sure but they, they you know they hit civilian areas and, and caused a lot of damage and, and killed a lot of civilians um so i mean ukraine needs to be seen um as the uh, the innocent party should we say they the, the ukraine can't afford to really do anything which will see them as have them be seen as an aggressor um so you know you, you know ukraine could preemptively strike these bases in russia and they would you know probably deal a huge blow to you know r- the russian plans if the, if it happened but then they started a war with russia you know they've, they've they've started the war at that point well not in the start of the war but they've escalated with with russia so the, the really unfortunate thing is ukraine almost has to kind of stand around and wait for russia to act which obviously puts them on the back foot. You know, Ukraine needs to respond. They almost can't um, be proactive with any kind of action they take. It's interesting, though, because I'm not sure whether that's going to be make much difference because Russia is already kind of, you know, interpreting anything, any defensive actions that Ukraine is taking as a provocation or mm-hmm. it's claiming provocations that didn't actually take place. And if that is the case, then no matter what Ukraine does or does not do, it will you, Russia will seek strike to portray it as an aggressor. No, and that is again a, a really good point. Like I said um, the I mean, what's the most recent one? They're claiming that the U.S. are planning chemical weapons attacks in eastern Ukraine, um, which anyone that's paid attention to Syria over the last few years will know that is the most common thing that Russia pulls out every time they want to do something. Mm-hmm. So they'll always claim that, um, you know, the, 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 the rescue organization, the White Helmets and um, Al-Qaeda are planning a chemical weapons attack in Idlib. And it'll say this is, you know, the, the, this stage of the chemical weapons attack. And it never happens. There's never a chemical weapons attack. There's never anything close to it and then everyone forgets russia's claimed it and then a few months down the line russia will say oh al-qaeda planned the chemical weapons attack in idlib again um so it was quite funny to see them change the target of their obviously ridiculous lies to um to ukraine and i was saying that okay the us are now planning the chemical weapons attack in in ukraine um which Again, yeah, I mean, I guess was nothing's impossible, but I'm 99% confident that it's false. You know, like I can't say 100%. Um, but the uh, the, uh, the the worrying thing about the claim this time is is they're providing a lot more specifics. So, um, the, you know, I think they, I can't remember what it was, but they named the chemical that was being used. They named the cities that were being targeted. They named the, you know the areas that the chemicals have been brought in and then both and then the separatist governments then jumped on the bandwagon and they claimed the same thing so whereas when you see it in syria you will normally see like one claim in russia today or in or in sputnik or something like that um you know like the state media um 
the the fact that this claim is being repeated again and again and again and again um is is a little bit more concerning because they kind of it's almost like they want they want people to remember it if slash when something happens you know provocation perhaps um and you know even even recently there was uh they arrested two what they called ukrainian spies in crimea who they claimed were going to attack um the naval base at sevastopol um they didn't really provide any evidence of it they provided some photos of i believe it was a car and the guy had a gun in the car or, or something along the way. There wasn't anything which made you think that this guy was about to carry out a, you know, a, uh, like, you know, an in-depth attack against, you know, the, the, the Russian Navy's Black Sea Fleet, which is what they claimed, you know, they, they might have, you know, maybe, they, maybe there was a bomb in the car, but they've, they've not said that, you know, it's, it's, it's it was completely ridiculous. Um, and it's, yeah, just every, every other week, it seems that, you know, they, they're kind of trying to pin something new on Ukraine. Um, I believe they arrested a hundred members of some Nazi organization who they now claim was an, a, a Nazi group, a Ukrainian group. Um, and there was a, a, a child arrested in Russia who um, the FSB claimed was encouraged to shoot up a school by someone in Ukraine. And it's just little things like this, you know, like it, it, something bad happens in Russia. And Russia's state media will be like, it's Ukraine's fault this is happening. This is Ukraine, 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 Ukraine. And I guess bit by bit, you know, the the, the people in Russia will, you know, the, I mean, the, I'm not saying the people in Russia are all brainwashed or the people in Russia are all easily tricked. But I suppose if you read the newspaper every day and you're constantly being told something, it's very difficult to, you know, um, believe anything else. Uh, I think there was a recent poll of Russians asking who they thought was to blame for the situation in Ukraine. And I think like 80 to 90% said NATO said we're to blame for the situation in Ukraine at the moment. So it seems like, you know, Russia or Putin specifically has the sympathy of the Russian people for what's happening in Ukraine. And if, you know, they were to get involved or were to get involved in a larger aspect, um, it seems they'd have the kind of the support of the Russian people, at least to begin with. Um, if they can, act, again, you know, as we said earlier, Russia, they like to act like the victim. They like to act like they're the ones being oppressed. Um, so if they can, you know, if they spin it as, you know, we're invading because we're being, <laughs> we're being bullied, then I'm sure that the Russian people would, would support them. Um, but, you know, it, it's difficult to say, you, you, you know, you, you never know how much support something will get until it happens. Um, but it seems at the moment, at least, if you believe Russian state media, which it's its own can of worms, um, that Putin um, does have support, does have the support, and that the people of Russia think that, um, you know, Russia is completely innocent in what's happening in Ukraine. So I guess that's a very dangerous combination at the moment. Is there any evidence right now to show that that clearly shows that not only is there an escalation in preparations but that a potential attack is imminent are there any types of weapons that have been transported in the past few days that are qualitatively different from the usual cars and tanks and whatever that were? Mm -hmm. is there anything new that is happening that that points to a more immediate likelihood of, of an invasion than than in previous in the last few weeks yeah, so the, the thing which always I always find them more concerning it isn't you know there was you know there was trains of dozens and dozens of tanks which are you know they're concerning on its own. The thing that I've always found more concerning is the logistics side of things. So you you know you can you can move as many tanks and artillery pieces in as you want if you don't have logistics to support them, um, then your your war isn't going to work. So. In the recent weeks, we've seen a lot more videos of logistics convoys, whether that be fuel, water, food, ammunition, stuff like that, being moved to the same areas that these armored vehicles are in. Um, and that, to me, suggests that things are less of a bluff 
and more of a kind of a real threat um, due to due to the you know due to the amount of of, of logistics that's involved. Um, you know, you, you know, they could have. I think back in like March and April, I think you know they just parked a couple of hundred tanks near the border. I don't remember seeing a huge amount of logistics. There might have been, um, and I'm just not remembering. But I don't remember seeing them in the same kind of quantity as have been in the last few weeks to the last month. Um, in terms of specific weapon systems, um, you know, there's been a, there was a, a couple of weeks ago there was quite a lot of anti-aircraft systems moved to camps near the front. Um, again, there's there's no exercises planned, so you, you know you can only you, you know the anti-aircraft systems are you know well they're defensive in nature, um, but you, you know you don't know why Russia would need them unless they were planning, unless they thought that maybe somebody were going to get attacked themselves, you know, unless they thought that there was a need to protect their own troops, their own equipment. Um, and they sort of moved the, the, you know, the, those systems in. Um, so yeah, there, there, there is a, a, I mean, a huge number of equipment um, around the borders of Ukraine. Um, the, I mean, you're talking in the hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of tanks and personnel carriers. So, you know, it, it is it is very concerning. Um, you know, when Russia would decide to act is, again, I, 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 I couldn't say for sure. I know there was, um, there was a rumor that maybe it happened, might have happened on New Year, on Christmas Eve. Um, and then I believe the US intelligence about a month ago said they believe it could happen in the first two months of 2022. Um, if anything happens, I think it will be after the new year. Mm -hmm. um, and especially after Orthodox Christmas as well, which is the 7th, I want to say, the 7th of January. Yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, after the Orthodox New Year, I think. Oh, after the New Year, yes. Yeah, sorry as well, yeah. Um, yeah, so I believe if, if we do see anything, it will, will be um, end of January through to mid-February. Um, but, I mean, again, I hope I hope nothing happens. I hope it is all just a bluff. Um, but the longer, I guess, this goes on and the more demands that Russia are making, um, you know, r ridiculous demands to NATO, um, the less likely it is that that it is above bluff or so or less likely it is that Russia can de-escalate without seeming like they've like, without seeming like they've lost or that they they're weak in some way. You know, like Russia are demanding that NATO um don't don't conduct any military exercises in Ukraine. They don't conduct any military exercises in Eastern Europe. Of course NATO are never going to agree to that. Um, it, it, it seems like they've just made demands um, that will get rejected and then they can say, okay, look, well, we tried diplomacy, it hasn't worked, now we have to try the military option. Um, you know, it, it seems like Russia kind of laying the ground to, because, you know, any invasion by Russia is going to spark massive, massive sanctions from both the US and the EU. Um, which is going to obviously impact Russia financially. Um, I believe I believe the one which Biden has threatened recently was cutting Russia off from a SWIFT banking system, which mm -hmm. they didn't do in 2014, 2015. Um, and again, if that happened, it would again cause cause a lot of issues for for Russia. Um, so I'm not sure if they, again I. I I, I'm not an expert on the Russian banking system. I don't know if they have kind of safeguards in place for that, if they've got plans in place for that for getting cut off from SWIFT. Um, I know recently there was rumors that Belarus was making plans to join the Russian banking system and leave the SWIFT banking system. Um, and again, it's it's Belarus is a weird one. It's one that it, it, it seems like they might be involved in any kind of new war with, with Russia and, and Ukraine. Um, but also, why? Why would they be involved? I don't know. I don't know why they, <laughs> why they would want to get involved um, unless they've been promised something from Putin. Um, but yeah, it, it, it is the longer things go on, 
Um, it's just seeing things are getting more and more likely. Um, it seemed at this point in the last build up in March and April, things were starting to de escalate, you know, maybe six weeks in, six to eight weeks in. Um, and it, it seems like things are still escalating. There's still um, a basis around Ukraine, there's still equipment arriving, it's not leaving it, you know, it's coming in. So it seems like you know, we, we, we've got in for at least, a, I'd say, another month um, of waiting, well, maybe not a month of waiting, but, the, you know, the amount of equipment that's being moved in, it seems like they don't plan on leaving anytime soon. So, yeah, it, it's seeming like more of a real threat at the moment than any kind of bluff. So I wanted to ask kind of a bit of a controversial question here. Even, uh, going back to the issue of the supply of weapons to the separatists, we are seeing sort of an analogous situation in Yemen with Iran and Houthis. Mm -hmm. Initially, that relationship was kind of underplayed and the Houthis went out of their way to kind of deny any real direct, you know, relations. But as time went on, it became increasingly obvious not only that there is military support, but that uh, Iran is actually pulling the shots on a lot of these operations. Now, uh, we've seen Hukis eventually gain, you know, gain access to very sophisticated ballistic missiles and drones, uh, consistent, uh, consistent tr level of training from other proxies, some level of military advisors from IRGC, even on the ground, and of course, all sorts of other uh, logistical support training and so forth. How close is that situation replicated in Ukraine with the separatists? Um, I think it's, it's a, I think it's a good comparison to make. Um, again, there are definitely um, you know proven beyond a doubt that there are Russian. Um, military officials in eastern Ukraine. Um, Ukraine claims that a lot of the, the separatists kind of command structure, so the officers and so on, are um, Russian Russian military. Um, you know, they, they're obviously they're trained on a lot of sophisticated Russian equipment. Again, going back to the shoot down on the Malaysian airliner, it was the um, you know a, a, a book missile system, um, which you, you know you you can't just walk into it and know how to work it. You have to be trained on to use something like that. Um, and I believe it was, um, I, I believe it was Russian separatist or even, uh, that, that kind of fired the missile, um, or, or I, I could, I could be misremembering then. It, it, could, it, might, it might have even been, um, you know, Russian soldiers themselves. But I, I believe it was Russian separatists who were operating the system when the aircraft was shot down. Um, but obviously they were trained on how to use it by the Russian military, um, so I think that, that is something that goes on a lot. You know, like there is a, a transfer of weapons, um, a transfer of like weapon systems, like tanks, artillery, and and, and so on. And obviously, the, the Russian government is very invested in training them how to use it properly. Um, the, the one thing we haven't seen, like Yemen, um, is uh again well you know like ballistic missiles or or drones you know like you know, the, the, the houthis in yemen um regularly regularly you will use drones and ballistic missiles to attack saudi arabia and claim that these drones are are uh, locally made that's what they claim all the time they you know they, they take an iranian drone they paint it differently they give it a different name and they claim it's new you know that, that's the, that's the way they they do it um we haven't seen anything like that as such um in eastern Ukraine where, you know, they've got a new weapon system and they're like, oh, we designed this, we we built it, we've created this, and it's clearly a Russian system. We haven't seen anything like that, but there are definitely, um, you know, like Russian military advisors on the ground in eastern Ukraine training and advising, um, maybe not so much fighting like they would have been in 2014, 2015, but definitely they in the background, um, you know, just, 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 you know, making, yeah, making decisions and so on. So the one big difference, of course, here is the use of, you know, the fact that Iran itself has not sent its own forces directly in mass numbers to partake in 
in in battles in Yemen, but mm -hmm. Russia seems likely to do so, and it does not seem to. Uh, it, it, the suppers have not really sought to expand beyond the territories that were already gained control, but it's very likely that with Russia's forces coming in, that will change, and Ukraine, in fact, may be ultimately divided. But so far, there is no clear sense that Russia is looking for the takeover and complete control of the entire country, which is what Iran is seeking in Yemen. Yeah, so yeah, there's yeah, there's no, I don't believe Russia is planning to to take control of the entire country. I mean, I don't believe, I mean, I'm sure they've got the troops to, to, to try it. Um, but I that would be complete political suicide, I believe, for Russia to, to, to do something like that. It would be almost unheard of, well, absolutely unheard of um, in the 21st century for an entire country to be annexed like that. Um, you know, if you look at like a, you know, a map of Ukraine, like my, again, my my opinion only would be they, they almost want to kind of um, push from the east um, up until the, um, I'm going to mispronounce the name of the river, the Dnieper, Dnieper River, river um, near Odessa. Um, and there's quite a natural break there. But then they could almost control the entire Ukrainian coast of the Black Sea from Crimea to the Russian border. Um, and that would be a, you know, a, that, that, that would be a, a huge, huge decision for Russia to make. Um, and one, I, again, I think would be, again, like a massive, massive escalation. Um, but, you know, saying that, if that was legal, I don't know why they have so many troops up in the north, which are nowhere near that region. So it, it's difficult to say, you know, the, 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 the goals of the separatists have always been, they want to control the whole Donbass region, um, which, you know, it, it is possible they could literally take the entire eastern part of Ukraine, not just a small territory they have. You know, Russia could move in and literally carve off, um, you know, the eastern fifth or the, the eastern eighth you know portion of of, of ukraine difficult to um say for certain what russia's goal is but i i mean i i'm, I'm fairly confident in saying they don't want to take the the entire country that would be that would be um a little bit too far i think for them well Depending on how things go, it will be interesting in the future to discuss what is the potential for, to disrupt uh, Russia's supply chain of logistical issues into the country. What mm -hmm. what will be possible in order to kind of um, disrupt the three potential fronts in the war and so forth. But let's hope that the situation can be escalated before it comes anywhere close to that. Oh, no, definitely, yeah. Yeah, I would hope that some combination of sanctions and, you know, potentially seeing, you know, a potential for kind of for really real political isolation for Russia in the event that they decide to enter Ukraine would be a deterrent. But, but you know, let's see what happens so far. I'm, I'm not optimistic, but I'm hoping for that outcome. Yeah, and I mean, I feel like any any Russian, um, I don't think Russia plans on having a long drawn out conflict. I think any action they take, they they want it to be over in in weeks, in week, and maybe you know a couple of months at the most. I, I think Russia want to hit hard and hit quickly, and achieve their goal in a very short amount of time. They want then, to turn it into a PR victory for their own supporters. Exactly, exactly. You know, like Russia being bogged down in a long conflict it, it isn't going to be, isn't what they want, um, you know, to, 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 to you know, for the, for the people back home. So, yeah, and I, I think, you know, if they can hit hard and hit quickly and, and get some, um, and make gains, you know, like significant gains very quickly. Um, again, like, like you know, like in the in the south, in the Donbas region, like the city of Mariupol, Mariupol, or Mariupol, sorry, um, was a major goal for the separatists in 2014, 2015. If they could capture that city very quickly, that's a 
big bargaining chip, shall we say, in any kind of negotiations that come from that. So if Russia can gain a lot of, you know, make a lot of ground very quickly, then it puts them on the on the front foot for any negotiations with Ukraine or with the US or, or NATO or the EU or whoever they so decide to negotiate with. Um, so yeah, I, I don't think we'll be seeing any kind of long drawn out conflict. Um, I think even the, the, the most recent war between Armenia and Azerbaijan, I believe that was six weeks, maybe seven weeks, if that, um, maybe even less than that. Um, I, might, I, might be, I might be overestimating. Um, but I don't think we'll we'll see anything even close to that. I, I think if there is uh, an invasion by Russia, um, I fully expect the UN and you know the US especially um, to step in and force a settlement before things go go on for too long. I would certainly hope so. Well, thank you so much for this really enlightening conversation, and I am going to be following your work very closely, and I hope. Many in the audience will be as well watching these these events. Uh, let's hope this is never much, you know, this is kind of does not really, the worst does not come to pass. Yes. <laughs> that's, I think that's, uh, um, you know, wars are not anything to celebrate, even in no. the rare instances when they're necessary for whatever reason. This is certainly not one of those. And, uh, <laughs> Let's hope that uh, that the uh, cooler minds will prevail. Yes, no, definitely. Thank you so much for your work, and uh, we'll be uh, keeping track of further developments, and perhaps uh, eventually, depending on how things play we'll have a, a different discussion about what happens. <laughs> yes, thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Bye.